What's up, man? Hey, buddy. So this is my buddy, Kalen Jones. He is the Texas Longhorns beat writer for The Athletic. You have been a busy man, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have. It's been a... You know, obviously, you know, RJ, this is my first year on the beat. So, yeah. You know, the, the first time I talked to you, you know, and I, I remember reading a call. Some dude was like, RJ knows way more. And I'm like, you probably still do. But at the same time, I was like, yeah, I have no clue what I'm doing. But <laughs> at this point, I feel a little bit more comfortable. But now the ship, you know, has been rocked all over again. So I'm just kind of, you know, getting through these past couple of days. I knew, you know, you knew the storm was coming. You could see it in the distance. But I did not expect it to come this soon. So it, it's been a wild few days. <laughs> well, first of all, bump the commenters, dog, because like I'm reading your columns and they real good. Like I, I've enjoyed. You wrote a piece about Parker Braun that I didn't think got a, enough praise, uh, and I was planning Appreciate to. Appreciate that. Yeah, I was planning to actually uh, blog about it, but like, yeah, that dude's remarkable, and that family's remarkable, and I just didn't expect to read that. So that, no, that was awesome. Uh, oh, yeah. Appreciate you, man. Seriously, appreciate that. Nah, nah. Just you, you doing work. You doing work. And and by the way, it ain't easy being on this beat. It's never been easy oh. to be on this beat. So, like, oh, no. if any, <laughs> I was about to say, if that was part of the sales pitch, nah, it's cool. It's, it's you know, it's, it's nothing. No pressure. Now that you know <laughs> what this is like after a full year, 12 games of this, what's mm -hmm. your sense of the building? What's your sense of the program and where it is right now? Dang, man. You know, and it... it it's interesting because you could see Tom Herman kind of go through, I guess, like, he's very much more self reflect Like, it's, it's humbling. He's been humbled. Like, mm. you know, last year mm. you had the success. And really, when you look at it, the fact that Texas was able to rip off that 10-game or 10-win season without, you know, I guess, in my opinion, you know, that talented of a team. When you look at the fact that they were able to sustain that kind of, you know, uh, a results – and get to, you know, put themselves on the precipice of, you know, proverbially being back. Um, I think, you know, this year was extremely humbling for the entire program. I think there's been a lot of self-reflection. And the fact that, you know, he's made the hasty decision hmm. or drastic decisions of having to, you know, remove people who have been a part, like been integral to his success throughout the entire course of, you know, his head coaching career so far, when you talk about Tim Beck and Todd Orlando, like, uh, re reassigning Tim Beck and then, you know, ultimately firing Orlando. I mean, that says a lot about, you know, what he's doing and what he's, you know, viewing and where his, I guess, like head is in terms of what the direction is of this program. Cause he said it over and over again, like him and Chris Del Conte are on the same page. Like they believe the program is headed in the right direction. And I tend to believe that too, but at the same time, they need the results to be immediate. Like this at Texas, they cannot afford, you know, for four year rebuilds, it has to be immediate and it has to come fast. So, you know, he's at the point where it's extremely pivotal and he's made, you know, kind of put, put the cards out on the table and said, Hey, this is what I got to do to get, to elevate the program to where it's expected to be. So we'll see what, what happens moving forward, but it, it's definitely been a wild roller coaster over the past few days for sure. Right. I mean, uh, you actually pointed out in your column that Drew Maringer and, Tom Herman had been basically tied at the hip through five different programs since like 07. And I've mm -hmm. known that guy as an excellent recruiter. I mean, he's the reason that Brew McCoy was in the boat. He's the reason Jake Smith is the heir apparent to Devin DuVernay out there. And we could talk about what they got coming back and what they got leaving, but what's your sense about the offense in particular? Because we can talk about the defensive coordinator position, and I understand that, but like the way that they were getting shut down as of late, with this power mm -hmm. spread that is his baby. Like, it's his offense. It's what he ran so well at Ohio State and what he's built his legacy on. Is he willing to let that go? Yeah, and I think that's going to be the biggest thing. That will be the ultimate test of mm -hmm. his humility. Will Tom Herman be willing to let go of, you know, the offense that he calls and allow someone else to really, you know, try to revamp and take advantage of the weapons that he has available. Because, I mean, let's face it, that Texas offensive line did not look good mm -hmm. from, I mean, probably before the midway point through the year on. Like, it, it struggled. Even Samuel Cosme at times, you know, whether it was getting penalties or, you know, somehow getting beat by these edge rushers, like, it, it wasn't coming together for Texas offensive line this year at all. And even when they ran the football, it looked really inconsistent. Like, you didn't really see them. Like, as, as games wore on, and I think that's the mark of a good offensive line, as games wore on, they were able to, you know, dom get more control of the line of scrimmage as games progressed. But the problem, like, they weren't dominant. They, it was not a dominant unit 
really at any point of the campaign. I think that's where the biggest issue lies. And, you know, moving forward, like you mentioned, getting rid of the power spread or, or potentially getting rid of the power spread or revamping it. I mean, there's weapons on the outside that still are present. I think when you look at the way they were using Brendan Eagles, the way they're using Malcolm X, uh, excuse me, Malcolm Epps, like the the manner in which they were using those two guys, you're probably going to maximize Eagles as you know someone who's a vertical receiver going to get downfield isn't you know the sharpest route runner. Same with Malcolm Epps, someone who in the mold of Colin Johnson is kind of a safety valve possession receiver, a good guy in the boundary to have. Um, but at the same time, you know we'll see how quickly you know jake smith's progression comes along like we saw him burst out at the beginning of the year then he kind of tailed off and hit the proverbial freshman wall through the midway camp midway of the season then the last two games kind of showed up again like the talent is obviously there and then i think the biggest question and i think it's been an underlying question mark that really can't be overstated the fact that texas did not have jordan whittington mm-hmm. who i think ultimately would have been a bigger difference maker probably than devin duvernay or colin johnson if you're talking about you know that one player, you know how Oklahoma has a CD lamb? Texas does not have a player like that. And I think Jordan Whittington is that caliber of player, potentially, you know, first round pick in the NFL draft. If he, you know, ends up staying healthy and reaches the potential that is believed of him, you know, both internally and externally. And I think having him back and what they decide to do with him and how they use him moving forward will be really significant in regards to how successful the offense is next year. And, you know, we're not even, I haven't even mentioned him, but Sam Ellinger, having him come back is especially huge because, again, like he's shown before, he's capable of playing, you know, at the level of of elite college football quarterback. But the question is, you know, whether or not he's going to be included in a system that maximizes his talents moving forward or whether or not they want to go to something that, you know, gets the ball out of his hands more quickly moving forward. I think that's, that's what remains to be seen and really is, you know, going to be the most interesting thing to watch the positives from this texas let's call it a campaign like the top positive from the campaign sam ellinger did progress as a passer he got better Mm -hmm. he's not elite Mm -hmm. but we also know that tom herman is a really good judge of talent it's about how they use that talent because i continue to cite for people joe burrow was brought to urban meyer by tom herman and he Mm -hmm. told him Hey, I found your Alex Smith, and Urban didn't really believe him. They had a battle. Joe Burrow went into the portal, went to LSU, ran an antiquated offense. They overhauled it, right, with mm-hmm. with what we all know as the, a modern passing attack and a modern form of playing offensive football with a dude that came out of William and & Mary and was an, essentially a also-ran assistant for the New Orleans Saints. And they said, no, we're just going to do this and not that. And the idea that Herman would be able to marry his recruiting savvy – with a guy that he could really just trust to run the offense or run the defense is also how you draw it up for most head coaches that succeed. I mean, Dabo Sweeney is not the most intelligent football guy in the world. He'd tell you that, but he doesn't have to be. He hires people, he pays them what they're worth, and he goes and he closes your deals and gets you your five stars to go run your defense. I want Mm -hmm. to see, as you pointed out with the humility, whether or not Tom Herman is willing to be that guy. Because there's only a handful of dudes that look like they can get away with being the play caller and the head coach, but how many of them win a national championship? And that's essentially what both Texas and Oklahoma are chasing for that matter. And to your point about Jordan Whittington, yes, because you have tools. But I also want to add to this with the movement that you've seen with the offensive assistants and the defensive assistants and whatnot, two things. Mm-hmm. First is, how bold is that to do friggin 16 days before signing day <laughs> i mean that's the crazy part right right and it, it was it was so you know nerve-wracking because the first first recruit or first commit that uh texas had like react on on social was a decommitment like a defensive player right and he decommitted and in my head i'm thinking wow that what if they end up losing everybody else and all of a sudden the other recruits start you know tweeting their their little longhorn or hookums and tweeting their support and everything else. I talked to a few and they're like, yeah, we're, we're good. And so they're solid. <laughs> so it, it, it was really nerve wracking. We'll see what happens on signing day because there's still, like you said, there's still two weeks before that period. But I mean, man, it, it's extremely bold. And it says a lot. It, it speaks to the faith that they have in Brian Carrington too, mm. the recruiting director who they elevated to a full-time, you know, interim position so that he can go out and hit the road and kind of reassure the recruits the direction of the program. Because, again, I mean, I don't I, I 
can speak to Drew Merringer, like you mentioned, like you mentioned, like a lot of former players, pa- parents, for example, they mentioned how important Drew was and how influential he was in a lot of these different uh, players' recruitment. So I think losing him could ultimately be costly, but we'll see. I mean, they have a lot of faith in Brian Carey. And that dude has been particularly interesting in the few times that he's been talking to people, you know, on the on the record, and especially in, when I get to listen to him, what he has to say, also came by – Houston, correct? He traveled with the staff. Yes, he yes okay. he was with he was in he's a Houston alum. Okay, so, so he yes. so he understands being able to go and get Ed Oliver. He understands being able to help you close on some of these kiddos that are high value targets for most everybody else. Question I have is now that he's elevated to the on the field road is a role. Is there any way in which he can keep one, or is he going to go back to being recruiting director as soon as this? early signing period ends and the staff gets filled out in January. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he actually ended up keeping a, a coaching position because, again, like you you had Tim Beck, you had Drew Marriager, who really were the spear, spearheading uh, the recruiting effort outside of Jason Washington. And so I, I think that he'll end up being on staff. Again, like the role, the official title, <laughs> I think that remains to be seen because, again, they were pretty vague about in the, uh, excuse me, the the press release that they put out. But right. again, like I, I think he'll end up being one of those 10 full-time staffers. It wouldn't surprise me one bit. Now that we, we know that this is out there, right? And we know that they're going to be shopping for assistance and you're telling the recruits, do you believe in me? Do you believe in what we're going to do? It's, it's not unlike what Lincoln Riley had to do last year when he had to close strong without a defensive coordinator, right? And he mm-hmm. had to get all of his kids that were already on the roster, let alone the ones that he's recruiting, to buy into whomever he decided to go get. So you're going to have to do that all over again. My next question was, really, honestly, what do you expect from Texas next year if you're a Texas fan? Do you expect all of a sudden to win 10 games, to win 11 games, to be back in a Big 12 championship game? Or what's going to be, what's it going to take for you to believe in Tom Herman past year four? I mean, if you're looking for a barometer of whether or not he passes, I think, nine, again, 9-10 nine, wins – nine, 10 wins and a big 12 title appearance at the very least like that. And that was the goal this year, really and truly, but again, the same, the goals are the same, Mm -hmm. but that being said, I think you mentioned it earlier, the the good positive things. And it really is something that Herman uh, talked about post game following the season finale was the fact that they had so many young players, particularly on defense. Again, they were replacing eight full-time stars to begin with. And then seven of seven other starters for this season on the depth chart, on the opening depth chart, were underclassmen. Mm. So all those guys have experience. I mean, after the game, it was hilarious to me speaking with, you know, sophomore linebacker Joe Sai, mm. and he starts talking, like I asked him about, the, hey, how great was it having the young players get so much experience this year? He start, he's like, yeah, it was good for them. I'm like, dude, you are a sophomore. What do you mean them? You. This was your <laughs> first year starting. So, I mean, you really – and really, I think it's going to be monumental for them moving forward. I think the defense is going to be, you know, they won't be, I don't. I won't say they'll be great, but they will be significantly improved, or at least that should be the expectation. And then again, you're bringing back Sam Ellinger with a lot of talent on offense. I think there, there should be higher expectations. But that being said, I think the expectations probably were a little bit bloated last year, coming into this year. Even if, you know, internally they're thinking, yeah, Big 12 title game, like being content for that, sure. But again, I think when you look at the expectations for what they have coming back and what they should be, even regardless of, you know, who ends up being office coordinator or defensive coordinator, the talent is definitely there. And the experience is there. Like this year was your year where you could say, yeah, these players are inexperienced. I mean, even the ones that, you know, saw some time in the sugar bowl, that's great and all, but they didn't bat. They weren't really battle tested throughout the entire course of the year. Like exact example. Um, you have Joe Sai, who started, I believe, four games. He appeared in all 14, but it's not like you're seeing on the field, like, full-time starting jobs. So I think that experience cannot be overstated. I I don't think so at all. And that being said, you know, the the question mark is whether or not, you know, a new offensive coordinator can step right in or a new defense coordinator can step right in and elevate, you know, the, the talent that they have right now and lead to better results. I think you saw that in Herman's first season. I mean, when Todd Orlando first stepped in, when Tim Beck first stepped in, both units improved significantly from when from what they did in Char- Charlie Strong's final year. So I, I think you'll see that kind of rejuvenation, just not only from a player perspective where you're happy about, you know, or excited about being in a new system and having another shot 
at getting back to where they are. But I mean, you look at the coaching staff, like Tom Herman is fully aware, like what is at stake here? Like if he does not produce the season that is expected, then this is it. So I, I expect him to have, you know, more to, to take, like to take a really, really good approach because again, like if he doesn't get this right, then he's out. 